let me suggest two. First, about a century after the time of Jesus, there was another Jewish messianic movement. Um, the Roman emperor Hadrian um, was taking over Jerusalem, turning it into a pagan city, forbidding the Jews to do their usual things like circumcising children, etc. And there was this Jewish revolution with a new Messiah uh, who was called Simeon ben Koziba, alias Bar Kokhva, son of the star. He was, he was going to be the Messiah. And lots and lots and lots of Jews really believed he was the Messiah. They minted coins to celebrate his new reign. It was a very small area that he was ruling, but they really believed this was the beginning of God's new world. They minted coins with the year one, and then the next year they minted coins with the year two. You know who else restarted the calendar? French revolutionaries. Uh, you, at least in America, didn't think of doing that when you kicked us out 250 years ago. Um, um, we so, still might. We yeah, still well, might, yeah. Quite, yes, yes. Yeah, no, I, 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 can, I can believe anything. Um, but uh, at the same time, those coins had images on representing the temple in Jerusalem, which was not standing, but which was their goal, that they would eventually defeat the Romans and rebuild the temple. In other words, they were saying simultaneously... The new age has begun. This is year one, but we now have a task to do. We want to rebuild the temple. And they were living in what we in the trade call a now and not yet situation, that something was already true, something had been truly launched. It wasn't a false, as far as they were concerned, it wasn't a false dawn, but that gave you an agenda for where you then had to go to complete the job. Now, that's 100 years after Jesus, Jesus himself has a similar two or three year uh, time in uh, his public career, if you like. And it's clear that Jesus believed and his followers believed that something really was happening during that period. And then the gospel writers writing it up that something really did happen in his crucifixion and resurrection through which the world really did become a different place. But that doesn't mean that everything is done overnight and that suddenly utopia arrives, you move into a now and not yet situation. So the second thing is that the New Testament is written by people who are being persecuted, who are being hunted down, who are in prison, who are being um, isolated, um, all sorts of things. And yet it is they who are saying, and some of the letters from prison say this more strongly than anywhere else, that actually we are already part of God's new movement through which the world has been changed and will be changed. And so one could say they were whistling in the dark. Lots of people have said that. And as you've hinted, we sort of look back and we think, well, nothing much has really changed, has it? And actually, I want to say, actually, yes, a whole lot has been changed. I, I was an ancient historian before I was a theologian, and I know a bit about what the world of ancient Greece and Rome and so on was like. It was pretty brutal. Unless you were well off, you probably didn't have access to medicine. You and your children wouldn't have access to education, except in the very basic, uh, very basic sense. If you were poor, you would likely stay poor because nobody was looking out for you. There's no social security. Um, all sorts of things that we today in the Western world take for granted as values, even if we find it difficult to achieve them, like forgiveness, like humility, and so on, were not considered values at all. Forgiveness and humility was just weakness. That was for wimps, a kind of a, you know, ancient version of, of Nietzschean morality, that, that you shouldn't be like that. And the fact that we today have such a strong sense of public education, I was going to say of public health, I would say it in any other country, but I'm not sure whether it obtains here or not. Um, uh, you know, the, the rest of us really just can't understand. No, 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 that's gone together. Um, but, but, but also of a sense of obligation to the poor um, and of obligation to people who are unlike ourselves. These things come deeply from the Jewish tradition as mediated and spread through the Christian tradition. And they just weren't there before. And they have colored all sorts of things in our cultural life, in our ethical life, in our public discourse. And we, we kind of grow up with this, with sort of post-enlightenment values, and it's common to sneer at Christianity and say, oh, Christianity is part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And, and of course, Christianity is part of the problem because it consists of frail, fallible human beings like you and me. And those of us who've worked in the church know perfectly well that we are not perfect, either individually or as, or as a society, but we are called to 
bear witness to and to work for the fact of God's kingdom, which is the transformation of human life here and now. We won't build it by ourselves. We can build for the kingdom. We are doing things which will count into God's new kingdom, new day when it eventually comes. But because we can't do it all, that doesn't mean we can't try because the church has transformed. Actually, the church has transformed the world down the years.